I want to welcome the owner and the CEO of Acronis, Mr. Sergei Bulusov. Uh, hello, everybody. Very good to see you today in the morning. Uh, Acronis has a special tradition now. We start all of our events exactly on time. So when you come next time to any of our events, don't be late. It's important. Uh, so first of all, I, I wanted to start with something which is very dear to me. So Acronis is crazy about two things, about Singapore and about uh, Acronis. Everybody in Acronis are crazy about it. Um, you know, we have a big office here in Singapore. Uh, we have uh, all this uh, rebranding, which we have done two years ago. Uh, we were founded in Singapore by me. I'm Singaporean, as you guys know. We moved our HQ back to Singapore about two years ago. We opened an R&D facility. We intend to have 150 engineers here. And we hope to be number one uh, most advanced uh, software engineering facility in Singapore. And we cooperate with a variety of people who help us a lot to be here. Because Singapore is not, it's a very convenient place to be, but it's not the most easy place to be. And, and so what we're doing here, we're building Singapore Global Technology Leader, and we're crazy about its brand. And, and you know, some of you know that about two years ago, I made a tattoo. I have actual tattoo of Acronis brand on my shoulder. But that wasn't enough, and so I went on and I actually got this Vespa, branded Acronis. Um, it's actually Armani Vespa, um, uh, and, and you can drive it in Sintosa, where I live. Then I got the Acronis BMW, right? So I drive Acronis. But have you ever have you seen it on the street? No? Any of you? Well, Acronis employees must have. Right. And then I just recently bought a boat, and I called it Acronis. Uh, it, it goes 100 kilometers an hour which is a bit slow, I think Acron is going much faster. So I'm thinking I need to upgrade. But that all wasn't enough. That all wasn't enough. And so we decided that we need to uh, promote our brand uh, much better and promote Singapore much better. And we decided to be um, the premier Singapore company to sponsor Formula One. And so you might have read in the press, and we officially confirm that we are about to start sponsoring Formula One team Toro Rosso with its uh, with its wonderful uh, uh, head chief, um, Franz Tost, who is an amazing leader, uh, really passionate about what he's doing. And the two good drivers, uh, Carlos Sainz, who is Spanish, and Daniel Kvyat, who occasionally is uh, Russian. And, you know, Toro Rosso is the second team of Red Bull. Red Bull is a geeky brand, right? Geeks drink Red Bull. Um, you know, normal people typically don't drink Red Bull. And Toro Rosso is the geeky of the geeky because it's a second brand of Red Bull. So they have a very passionate team. They have a very passionate process. And they're underdogs. So last year they were number seven. Right now they are number six. We hope that with our help, they can get to be number five or number four or maybe even number three. They have the potential. And you should help us to sponsor this wonderful team and to win more races with Acronis brand. Thank you in advance. With that, I want to switch to my boring presentation about brands, uh, about trends. So first of all, I want to talk about the trends which already changed the world. So one of them is uh, cloud. And you know, people talk about the cloud quite often as a new trend, but it's over $200 billion in cloud services in my calculation, which is already going to be consumed this year. And, and so it's really not that new. Everyone now has an unlimited access uh, to uh, vast computing resources. And you know, today it's uh, only a few billion people on Earth, and there's still more people who don't have access to it. By, by 2020, everybody on Earth would. Every company, every person. Then the second trend is mobile, also very well known. It's still a big trend, 7 billion mobile subscribers, and that makes everyone on Earth have a very powerful mobile computer in, in, in their hands. This uh, Galaxy S7 is 20x faster than the computer who won against Kasparov, world chess player uh, um, um, in chess. And I, uh, my previous company, um, which is Parallels, uh, are sponsors of Magnus Carlsen, who is a world champion of chess today. And he told me in a personal conversation that he would lose seven games out of 10 to iPhone 5. And you know that probably would be nine games out of 10 to iPhone 6 Plus. And, and, and then finally, social, everybody's using social. And apparently, even Hillary Clinton is now using Snapchat. So Hillary Clinton used Snapchat to enhance her reputation with young population. How many of you guys here uh, use Snapchat? 
Okay, there are some, but you see everybody else, I'm not using Snapchat, I've tried after I prepared the speech and I couldn't figure out what, why to use it. We are all very old people. We shouldn't really think about ourselves as an internet people. Internet people are the ones who use Snapchat and apparently Hillary Clinton is definitely internet people. So this trends made uh, everyone have a always connected, very powerful computer to a very powerful cloud and they generated meta trends such as sharing economy, instant messengers, data-driven automated education, data-driven automated healthcare, data-driven automated government. It's all related to the fact that those things are about everyone, about majority of the population, majority of the companies. And if majority of the companies are using uh, mobile uh, connected to cloud devices, and they are always using them because of social, then you can do those trends. And the first two categories, you already have multi-billion dollar companies, and this, uh, these other categories are just catching up. So lots of tra traction in, in this meta trends. And on that, I, I, I always want to say that when people talk about cloud as a new trend, reality is that cloud is dead. All IT is cloud today. Everything we do in information technology is connected to cloud. It's Im almost impossible to do non-cloud business whether it's a cloud um, of public cloud or private cloud. And the only thing which cloud really is, is the three things which it brought to the architecture of information technology. Metcalf law, which is a network effect, the larger the network, the more valuable it is. With a cloud, the main thing about the cloud is that everybody's connected to it. The more people connected to it, the more powerful it is. The more resources on it, the more powerful it is, just because it's, it's this network effect. Then network effect and software, which is web standards. Now, the more powerful the standard is, the more people use it, and then it becomes more powerful, and the more people use it, and it allows to build software and build technology and build solutions much quicker. And so it's sort of network effect in uh, the software. And finally, scaling out architectures, which make the uh, cost of compute uh, cheaper as you go uh, grow number of users. In the past, before the cloud, architectures will scale up. And in fact, when you go to mainframes, cost of compute was more expensive than the cost of compute on a Unix server, which was perhaps more expensive than the cost of compute on a, um, uh, on a PC server. Uh, with the cloud, it's the opposite way. The more users you have, the more servers you have, the cheaper you have a cost per user. Then actually, in fact, even technology is dead because uh, there, everything, every IT is dead because technology is always about IT. You cannot imagine any device, any piece of technology, any um, car, plane, office building, projector without technology. Everything today is built with technology. Almost everything has a CPU in memory. Almost everything has an operating system. Almost everything has uh, software applications inside it. And finally, in fact, everything in the world is becoming technology. All of the business processes are related to technology and related to IT and contain information. Maybe perhaps today you can still have some manual processes, but over the next 10 years, those manual processes will basically disappear. And every personal process is becoming, personal, uh, becoming about information, about technology as well. Almost in all parts of our life, we use technology and we use IT. And so all objects in the world are becoming devices. So with that, what are the next technology trends? And um, in part of my career, I've spent as an investor. And at that point, I was trying to analyze which trends are more and less important. And I understood that one thing which I've come up with is that one of the basic trends in technology is to enhance human productivity, is to save time. And, and those trends are you know, quite big, and they grow quite slow because changing Human productivity is about changing human behavior, and it takes time to change human behavior. It takes time to change all these different chains of um, human connections in the world. Now, now the next type of trend, which is um, growing faster uh, quite often, is the trends about making money on, on something. Making money on, say, information, money on money, is a trend which tend to grow very, very fast, because making money is something which is easier to change. And finally, the trends which are most unpredictable and most vast are trends which are about uh, satisfying basic needs. Satisfying basic needs are very hard to predict, but those trends are very sticky. And, and of course, there are also other things which are important, but they are not a good business. Uh, the, the, those are about uh, being very famous like uh, Julian Assange or being very powerful like Dr. Evil, 
We are only talking about the trends which are related to business. What is good business is about saving productivity, saving money, and satisfying basic needs. So first, about trends which are saving uh, productivity in the modern world. So one of them is Internet of Sense. Internet of Sense is a new trend, uh, sort of, right? But I mean, I remember when I started in IT, uh, imagine that 24 years ago, 92, I was 20 years old, and people were already talking about something like Internet of Sense at that time. And so it's a trend which taken a very long time to uh, pick up. Today, we already have 15 billion devices connected to internet. So it's a real business. It's a real market. And, and it's going to triple in, in less than five years. So it's going to be 50 billion devices used in the very specialized fields. And that definitely has an influence on the rest of the IT market. Robots, another big trend, just telepresence robots are expected to be $13 billion this year. I use this uh, double robot in our office. Have any, how many of you have been to our office in Singapore? Okay, not, not that many. Well, you can, you can try to use this robot in our office. We, we can teach you. Dennis here, our IT guy, can allow you to install an application. And with this application, with your iPhone or Android, you can drive this office through the robot and you can come to Steve and ask him why he's not giving you the right uh, partner program. And, and in fact, new robot has a um, new, uh, uh, new, new uh, telepresence robot with iPad has a very powerful speaker, so you can shout at him and scare him. Now, next trend is drones. It's again, uh, it, this is a newer trend, but again, if you think about it, what's new about drones? I think the first drones uh, were used by US Army probably 25 years ago. Now, last year, there was more drones registered by uh, Federal Aviation Authority in the United States and conventional aircrafts. So this trend is really trying to pick up and drones are starting to be used for some useful things. For example, Singapore Post have announced that they delivered some mail by post and Amazon registered drones to, to make a 30 minutes delivery for emotional purchases. And in the United States, there is a wonderful startup which allows you to pay some number of dollars to, to have the drone fly into your location and make a group selfie from the air. And that's actually probably the most successful drone used today. Self-driving cars, another great trend. Quite amazing, but this trend is actually happening. I mean, for me, when I've thought about self-driving cars, again, nothing new about it. I, I remember people spoke about it when I was still in school. They spoke about the fact that cars will be soon self-driving. You will install cameras on it. And there were a number of attempts to make it. But it's actually happening right now. I recently bought a Tesla for my dad, and I, I was, um, you know, sort of spooked of how close we are to self-driving cars. The Tesla of today, any Tesla of today, can park itself, so you can actually come down to your house, click a button on your iPhone, and it will basically drive to a garage, open the door of the garage, gets into the garage, and close the door of the garage. And then it can unpark itself, you can summon it. You can press a button, and it will open the door, come out of the garage, drive to you, and park next to you. It, it does it very slowly, because there is a lot of restrictions in US on how fast the self-driving cars can drive. I think they can drive at about two miles an hour. That's supposed to be not dangerous. And then Tesla is already able to drive itself in traffic. And, and it's not like it's driving itself in traffic with those, um, you know, I remember couple, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, Mercedes and BMW had those uh, uh, driving and parking tools where you can sort of set it up and it will keep the distance. But then if the road turns, you have to turn the wheel. And if you don't turn the wheel, you hit the wall. Tesla actually follows the road, and if you want to turn, you just click the, uh, uh, the, 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 the turning light, and it will change lines by itself. And you can click back, and it change lines by itself as well, and you can see all the cars around it. And so Elon Musk, which have proven to be following his promises on a lot of things, promises that he will have mass production by 2021 and fully autonomous by 2018. Imagine 2018, this is just two years from now. And you know, this Tesla car is not really a car. I, I gave the speech in Germany to our partners in Germany. We have the similar event in, in German-speaking Europe. And, and I told them this. And then I speak to a journalist later. And, and the journalist, when I, when I said, like, Tesla is a great car, this particular car, which I bought for my dad, goes up to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.7 seconds, which is quite amazing. You basically have your uh, uh, cheeks going back your uh, face. And, but uh, they told me, like, why would you want to drive this roaming computer? It's not a real car. And it's true. It's a roaming computer. Almost nothing in it is mechanical. Everything is electronic. And, and as any computer, for example, it's hackable. 
And finally, 3D printers. You know, the 3D printer industry is definitely, again, nothing new, but it's again something which come to infliction point and it's changing the world quite a bit today. And it's not about the size of 3D printers market itself, but it's about size of the market which it can do. It's about software defined sense. It's about printing sense you need. It's about us not ordering our souvenirs, but printing them in our own 3D printer in any way we want. Okay, money making uh, trends are more significant and the two most famous trends is vintage revolution. People quite often talk about blockchain, uh, Bitcoin in this regard, but from my standpoint, Bitcoin is a sort of a passing uh, fad. Much more important trend is blockchain and what blockchain can do for digital data. And I think we'll talk about it more today. And what we are doing with blockchain, we are very excited about it. But more importantly, everything in finance world is getting to be revolutionized around information. Banks have tremendous amount of information about people, but they monetize this information much worse than Google. Google has a lot of information about you, but banks still have a lot more because they know exactly where you are, what you pay, how much you make, who is your relatives, they have your profiles, and they don't monetize this information. Instead, they charge you a tremendous fee for financing, and, and they don't care if you are a very good person and pay your bills as much or you are not paying your bills potentially because they don't leverage the information. There's all the startups in the world which are actually, um, which are actually going to change the world in, in finance and personal banking, in peer-to-peer -peer finance and business finance and so on and so forth. And another big trend where you make money on information is big data. And this is just one example of uh, Chevron, which can make all of their old production much more efficient, make tens of billions of dollars extra profit per year on being able to analyze in real time information which is coming from their oil wells. It's very similar to General Electric, which now has a business model where airlines buy engines, but they pay based on the output of the engine. And uh, General Electric tracks all the information from the engines in real time and tunes the engine so it saves fuel and achieves 10 to 20% better fuel efficiency for the airlines, which is a huge uh, difference in, in airline profits. Then, of course, there are these trends which are related to meaning of life. And those are hardest to see, like, for example, uh, wearables. Um, you know, wearables now is uh, uh, about uh, $11.5 billion just in smartwatch. But I think the huge revolution in wearables will come when wearables will actually be able to make you more productive, to, prolong, to make your health better, and to prolong your life. Because it's just a matter of time before you have a wearable which will be able to precisely monitor the content of your blood, to precisely measure your blood pressure, to precisely measure the um, operation of your heart. And with that information, with the ability to process it, you can live many years longer. Because a lot of us live shorter lives because we don't, don't know when we get a disease. And with this, you can always know when you can get a disease. And you can prolong the human life by 10, 20, 30 years. And at that point, all of us will wear smartwatches or some kind of devices to monitor our health. Virtual reality, another huge trend, very hard to see. You know, supposedly $70 billion market in 2020. Would you imagine that? $70 billion? Who of you use virtual reality today? Okay, just few people. Why is it such a big trend? Because actually one of the problems of the physical world is that it requires logistics. For all of you to come here, some of you come from other countries to just listen to my stupid speech. You know, it's much better if we all wear some, go into some virtual reality rooms and we project ourselves and we feel as if we are in this room and, and it looks exactly the same and I give you a speech and you can listen to me and you can look where I'm looking and hear the everything about my speech. And it's totally possible in virtual reality and virtual reality promises to solve it for specialized applications like this, which is training, but also for general application like social networking. Now you can meet on social network, but it's really very primitive meeting, right? You can sort of like text to each other and maybe call each other and maybe you have a video. With virtual reality, you can have a real meeting. Artificial intelligence, very spooky trend. I've just read yesterday that uh, White House have created a special commission to study the, um, uh, the effect of artificial intelligence. It, it was just yesterday. IBM Watson, which is one of the first 
um, commerce and virtual reality. IBM amazingly continues to be one of the most innovative companies from the standpoint of generation new ideas in the world is 1 billion in 2018 and they promised it to be 10 billion in, in uh, about six years after that. Now, artificial intelligence is really spooky because it comes into the place where you can replace humans in a lot of places. When I gave this speech yesterday, one of the um, uh, media members in, in our press event asked me about whether we're going to replace our board members with, uh, with artificial intelligence board members and whether we're going to have an artificial intelligence chairman. And my first reaction was no, because I don't really believe that artificial intelligence can replace human first. But then I was thinking replacing board members will be quite convenient. <laughs> I don't really need them. And you know, if these things are so smart, well, why, why wouldn't they help me? And, and then um, you know, safety, security, and privacy. This is actually one trend where we actually play, because we are a lot about safety and privacy and, and somewhat about security. But the nature of the strand is very, very simple. Everything is digital. Everything is becoming digital. Everything is becoming vulnerable. All of a sudden, my dad is now worried. He, he can drive his car from like, his iPhone, and then he tells me, like, OK, how do I know that you couldn't drive my car when I drive my car? How do I know that somebody doesn't hack my uh, car, and I'm driving on the highway, and all of a sudden, it turns left when I want to turn right? And he's absolutely right, because in Tesla, there is not really, I mean, this is a joystick which is you turning, and this is a joystick which you're pressing, and even your brake is a joystick. And so if somebody hacks into the car, they can actually drive you anywhere they want. You know, you can see it in some movies about 10 years ago when people sort of drive BMWs, but that wasn't true. With Tesla, it's actually true. Tesla themselves, and we trust Tesla. Elon Musk is a wonderful guy, so you can completely trust him. But Tesla itself can easily hack into any Tesla and drive it around. Spooky. And finally, the computing itself is changing. Computing today is highly inefficient and based on outdated von Neumann architecture, and there is a lot of attempts to make it better. The Gordon Moore, who is a founder of Intel, about 50 years ago, actually more than 50 years ago, 51 years ago, predicted that Gordon Moore law will run out in 50 years. And it did run out. The Gordon Moore law was about uh, doubling the computing power in every 18 months. And what amazingly held for about 50 years, now it's no longer going to be possible. In fact, several years ago, it's already stopped. And if you notice, not so many people are upgrading their computers because the computers are not actually getting much faster. And so how to solve it, how to make the computers faster, and more importantly, how to make the computers to consume less power because the Earth needs more and more compute cycles. There is many contenders. One of the contenders is this. Uh, uh, the Machine Project by uh, HP. Uh, I would encourage you to look for a speech of Stanley Williams. Uh, it's uh, uh, the, one of the chief scientists uh, in HP labs and professor in Berkeley. And he talked in Singapore, in fact, when he visited Singapore, about future of computing. It's a very interesting speech. And that's something which you definitely need to worry about because if the Intel architecture <coughs> will be replaced by some new architecture, well, all of the programs will need to be rewritten. All of the solutions will need to be redone. And there is many other implications. So these are all sort of high level trends. I wanted to talk a bit about how is it relevant for IT community. So one of these um, uh, trends is cloud. Definitely something which you can see. And we hope that's why you're here, not just because of backup <coughs> a product of ours. Private and public cloud are massive share of IT market. That's the main buyer of the IT. And that's changing all of the way how the um, IT products are being sold because there are two, three things which are important about these buyers and sellers. They are quite different from large enterprises and from medium-sized businesses. First of all, they manage costs. So they constantly look for a solution which is better in cost and they manage costs for their customers. That's the value they provide to their customers. Second of all, they manage product. They actually don't sell the product, you sell them to the customer. They combine different products, they integrate them, and they create a new product, which is a service for the customer. And so they are very different buyers, and I, I spoke to distributors and resellers, uh, and value-added resellers and value-added distributors over the past 16 years, I'm, I'm in the cloud business. And you know, always in, in the last 16 years, and even in, in the last several years, and even this year, 
I keep hearing something, yeah, cloud is important, but we don't know how to sell cloud, and so it's not yet important for us, maybe. Well, it is important for everyone. You have to really understand how to deal with service providers. Service providers are not to be ignored. Service providers are going to be majority of IT purchases. Uh, new, new things in business. There is a lot of things which are changing in the way how people do technology business especially, but business overall. Automation, everything is getting automated, which allows disintermediation. Because if you think about channel, and we believe a lot of people in this audience are members of our IT channel. Channel existed because in the past it was manual. There was a lot of manual procedures related to handling, distribution, and selling. Well, as it becomes automated, you get more and more vendors tempted to disintermediate you. And more and more of your partners tempting to disintermediate you. App store and marketplaces, that's one way where you get disintermediated, right? You, you think about, can you be a distributor of Apple software? Can you be a distributor of app store applications? Well, not really. Apple takes vast majority, well, probably 99% of profit in this area. Selling experience is not, re, uh, uh, not a product. That's another big change. It's uh, really, um, selling product is no longer enough because of disintermediation, the channel needs to create experience for the customer and customer can buy an experience. Social brand and conversion, also very important. And that's why we put so much attention to our brand. Because in the modern world, it's very easy to become famous in both bad and good way. And finally, real-time analytics <coughs> and management, which is really important. You really need to know who is your customer and what they're buying today. And it's really possible with new tools. Another big thing for IT channel is who's going to be next Microsoft. Most of our partners are <coughs> historically build their business on Microsoft. You know, of course, we have partners who, who are older and they build a business on IBM, but those target larger businesses, core of our offering goes towards small and medium businesses, and that's where Microsoft has been by far the largest vendor over the past 20 years. Well, they are no longer. There is a lot of contenders to Microsoft. Who's going to be next Microsoft for you? Who's going to be the number one most important vendor? Is it going to be Microsoft again? Microsoft can come back. Microsoft is a very strong company. And Microsoft for us is still the primary contender to be this number one vendor, but they need to do a lot of work to, to be as significant as they were before. Google, Amazon, not very friendly to partners. Who of you make a lot of business with Google or Amazon? Nobody does a lot of business. Anybody does business with Google or Amazon? Okay, there are some people, as you can see. Who of you do business with Microsoft? Okay, many more people, you see. Who does business with open source? Okay, there are some people, you see. And, and then finally, what's next for all these vendors which were part of your core offerings? What's next for Cisco, HP, IBM, Dell, Oracle? Are they going to be replaced by Chinese vendors? Chinese vendors definitely have an edge in terms of the cost structure. And it's definitely happening. Cisco is very much um, um, threatened by Huawei. And HP is almost dead uh, because of the Lenovo. And, and uh, you know, um, IBM, Oracle, are somehow t staying it, take, keeping their grounds. And Dell, of course, is buying EMC, but in the meantime, it's uh, still losing market share. Also, what's next for Facebook? It's quite clear that next for Facebook is to be the ultimate communication vendor, but the question is how far this will get. Already today, I think one of the best ways to call people and one of the best ways to video call people is Facebook in terms of quality of the call. and. In terms of ability to reach somebody. For me, one of the main things with calling is that when you call somebody on the phone, their ringer is off, right? So they don't really um, you know, uh, answer. When you call somebody on Skype, they could be off Skype. But most of people who use Facebook, they're always on Facebook. So if you call them on Facebook, they pick up. Um, these trends could affect uh, IT communities soon. One of them is financial revolution. The question is what, what financial options you open to or, or offer to your customers. Definitely, uh, IT channel business is about financing as part of the value proposition. And, and historically, it was about some you know, factoring companies, and it's about some banks, and it's about letter of credits, and so on and so forth. With uh, FinTech revolution, there could be more options. And, and finally, there is Bitcoin. Any of you accept Bitcoin as a payment? OK. We don't accept Bitcoin as a payment yet, but we will. Uh, logistics. Um, another part of IT business is about logistics. Historically, many companies were proud about being logistical, and logistics is being changed by drones, robots, 
connected and autonomous cars, sharing economy, all of the logistic businesses being changed, you can deliver things much quicker. Big data, uh, that's another thing. That's something which we as IT community, we have a lot of data about our partners and customers. And also there is a lot of projects our customers and partners can do in big data. And how can we participate in that? New generation security and privacy. Security and privacy is becoming vastly important. I have uh, long-term partners who have been attacked by ransomware and, and now they understand the value of backup. Right, Nikash? <laughs> and uh, the fact is that now it's no longer something which happens to some remote places. You know, I remember that when I talked to people in, in, about computer security, they would tell me like, oh, security, yeah, okay, I install antivirus, but I really never had any viruses. Well, now you definitely know somebody who have actually suffered a loss of either productivity or money because of security breach. Either it's a phishing, either it's a ransomware, either it's a virus, either it's a Trojan. And now, as you become completely digital, all of your business and all of your life is uh, vulnerable. Virtual reality, another huge trend, potentially tens of billions of dollars uh, of revenue. And there is a lot of different use cases, lots of different projects, which different parts of the industries can run to uh, leverage virtual reality. That's some trends which are not yet for you. 3D printers, Internet of Sense, I guess it's coming, but not yet important in IT, wearable robots, artificial intelligence, next generation computing, quantum computing. But one thing which is very, very um, um, similar between all of those trends, all of those trends, are they turn physical world which we were born in and I, I don't see, see any 15 years old in this room. So most of us were born in the world which was mostly physical to the world which is mostly digital. And, and so that is actually my definition of singularity. This is when a digital world becomes much bigger and, and the real part of the world and the physical world becomes much smaller. Just like this is a burning man event in United States where um, crazy people and technology entrepreneurs Go inside. Anybody you been to Burning Man? No? It's an amazing experience I've heard. You can see wonderful scenes. So they go in the middle of Nevada desert and they spend several weeks there. They, there is no electricity, no water, no food there. So they have to bring everything with them. And they have to perform different trades. And so there is like a primitive community which creates there. And they have plenty of drugs and, and alcohol there. So a, a lot of fun. But that's how physical world will look for people who will live in digital world. So it, it looks weird for us, right? I mean, you see scenes there. I've never been there, but I, I'm, yeah. And so, but partners told me, like, you see naked people riding on the bike in the morning, like a procession of naked people on the bikes. They go to wash in some place, for example. You don't see it in the physical world today, normal physical world. But we doing business in the physical world will look as crazy to a people who live in the digital world 20 years from now. And so in the physical world, there was this four basic needs. They are widely publicized everywhere, air, water, food, and shelter. With every business process becoming, and personal process becoming digital, it's conducted with data. Data volume is expanding at a very rapid speed. There are different estimations. It's expanding 120% per annum, 50% per annum, 80% per annum, but very, very rapidly and exponentially. And data is becoming more and more valuable we believe that data protection is a thief's basic need. You need to protect your data. In the future, if you lose your data, you cannot continue your personal or business life in a normal fashion. It's already true today for large business. If you think about Central Bank of Singapore, if it loses the data, you know, Singapore economy is screwed because all of the data of Singapore uh, financial world is in Central Bank of Singapore. And so Singapore, uh, 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 central bank has to take care of its data and as any large company as well. But it's going to become the same for everyone. And so because of that, we are in Acronis building a number one data protection platform. In less than 10 years, we want to be number one globally in protecting data. Uh, and it's a, not just a data protection application, but it's a platform. And, and we believe that this is a huge market. We believe that it's, it's over a $100 billion market in storage services already today. And I believe in 10 years, it may perhaps a trillion dollar market. One of the largest markets in technology. And so this platform is based on our any data technology. It includes series of software products, backup, which is our traditional product, but also archiving, 
storage, software-defined storage, disaster recovery, e-discovery, chronic access, chronic monitoring, and, and set of consumer products. We are very focused on two things, partners and data. And so we can serve any customers with our partners and take care of their data. And we offer those products not only as software products, which you can sell to a customer, but also as a solutions, which you can install in your data center or leverage our data center and offer services to customers. And we also offer it as services. And there are several things which I personally wanted to tell you uh, about our products, which are special about our offer. So the first thing is um, about our focus on partners. And in that, I always give example of Intel. Intel is an amazing company. It's actually probably in some ways more amazing than IBM and Microsoft, which are some of the companies which are long term in this business, because Intel continues to be a technology leader and, and the market leader and the market share leader in number of industry over all these years. How do they do it? And, and you know, I remember I started in, in software business in 1992, and I, I was uh, 20 years old. And already at that time, I remember trying to learn about what I'm doing. And from various sources, I gathered that Intel is really a shit uh, processor, that there are so many other processors uh, which are much better, uh, like RISC processors, MIPS, UltraSpark, um, you know, um, and, and so on and so forth, PowerPC. And, and, and yet Intel continued to prevail and prevail and prevail. And how did they do it? It's because they enabled success of any partner. Because they offered not just CPU, like the other vendors, but also open architecture, which allowed other people to do business with their architecture and occupy the places of the market which they couldn't at that point. CPU, chipset, motherboard, platform, recipes, go to market. So Intel enabled engagement with them on any level. There is a wonderful book with that about this marketing high technology, which was actually written 32 years ago. You are our partners. We want to be Intel for you. I remember many, many people made money by, uh, and, and made huge margins and made billions and tens of billions of dollars with Intel. If you think about Microsoft, yes, there are companies who made money, but it's mostly resellers and it's mostly uh, distributors. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of billions. With Intel, we have companies like Dell. We have companies like Compaq. They are companies who make tens of billions of dollars. How did they make it possible? Because they enabled that one person company to start selling uh, servers. Just buy Intel platforms, put hard disk in it, put memory in it, and you have a server. You can label it, and you put your own brand on it, and, and you are a server maker or a PC maker. They can also enable a companies which are highly advanced, like HP and IBM, to make servers and, soft and, and hardware with them. Initially, uh, IBM would only buy a CPU. And then they will buy some ports of chipset, and then they will buy network cards, and eventually they buy a lot of things from Intel. But bottom line, it's important that Intel enable engagement on every level, a level and focused on success of partners. And that's what we want to do with this market as well. We are not only shipping the platform on the previous slide, but we also ship in infrastructure management, provisioning automation, operation automation, business automation, infrastructure monitoring. Uh, we support multi-partner tier model, professional services, custom development, go-to-market recipes, and uh, we provide open API and SDK. So any partner, very large company like Syncteo, very small company with two people can engage with us and offer a complete set of cloud services and can actually make money on it. We believe it's a huge market, and, and so there is a lot of money to split. We don't need to be greedy. The next thing which is very important is that we want to focus on control, on giving control to partners and customers. And I want to talk about a bit why is it important and why it makes us special. In fact, control is one of the basic human instincts. In fact, potentially, control is something which separates humans from everything else in the universe. This is a picture from Sistine Chapel. How many of you have been to Sistine Chapel? Okay, well, it's a it's great experience. You should go. It's amazing what you see there. Michelangelo was in, in a sort of innovator in, in his time. So it displays God. Apparently, he's displayed on the uh, shape of a human brain who takes a soul and puts the soul in Adam. And then there is um, um, this um, scene which is written in a base of a, a Jewish philosophy, which is a base of Old Testament and Christian religion as well is that the uh, free will, the ability to make your own decisions, the ability to have control, 
is a something in human soul which is out of this universe which allows humans to be close to God. And, and in a way, giving control to people and taking control to people is extremely important, even though sometimes it makes no sense. And so control, soul, security, freedom, free will, privacy, and control, it's all the same things. And they don't look very important. I, I remember when I started giving speeches about privacy and how important it is to keep control of your data and stay private, I was talking, I would be si sitting on the panels with very, very powerful and wealthy people, and they will tell me, huh, privacy? We don't need any privacy. You know, we are completely open. And I, I don't know who can say that. Immediately, if somebody say that, they lie, because everybody of us have some private information we don't want others to know. Uh, to the extent we don't want anybody to know. And so control is very basic, and that is what's special about us. So what we want is we want to give you control of various things on how you engage with us. We give you control of deployment, control of licensing, control of packaging, control of destination of data, control of delivery, how we deliver the data, control of your partner strategy. You sell direct, you have a distributor, you have a distributor who have a reseller, you have a distributor who has a distributor who has a distributor who have a reseller, it's up to you. Control of your business model. You can sell per gigabyte, per device, you can create your own offerings, control of your technology model, you can integrate in a variety of ways. You can use our core engine, or you can use our all offer, or you can use our service. You are in control how you do it, and it's very important because control enables you to have control of your margin. You can choose to have a low margin and low risk, or you can choose to have high margin and high risk, and that gives you control of your growth because your growth is fueled by your margin. In the channel business, most important thing is to have margin. If you have margin, you can spend it on marketing, getting new customers or hiring new employees. And finally, that gives you control of your success and gives you control of your growth. And it's a big difference between us and the other vendors. As we move forward with releasing our products, especially in the cloud, you will see how important that is. We believe that many of our competitors have a very good technology in terms of core storage, but they don't have a full platform. And there are some who have some things which are close to our full platform, but none of them ena enables you to do business in the way you want and give you control, which you can then transfer to your customers. And you know, here I, I just give an example of how control can result in, in fun sense. This is a fully automated yacht, which supposedly you can buy for a relatively low price. And within less than 18 months, you can learn how to drive it, and you can go around the world in less than one year alone. For me, it's sort of ultimate uh, thing about control because you can stop anywhere you want. You don't need to fuel, you just need water and food. So that's another thing is important. And again, the way we give it is by offering a Cronus hybrid cloud architecture, which allows you any protection, archiving, backup, cloud storage, disaster recovery, e-discovery, file sync and share, monitoring, and more. And again, you don't have to use all of it. You can say like, we don't like your Cronus for archiving. We use somebody else, but we only use your backup product. We also support very vast variety of workloads. Quite often, we are compared to companies which only uh, do virtualization. We do physical, we do virtual, we do mobile. We, we just announced that we're going to do Office 365, Azure. We're going to support all of the workloads your customers will have. We support any storage. We don't predestine uh, certain specific storage technology for storage destination. The customer can choose to backup locally with a cloud service, backup locally and to your cloud or to our cloud, or to Azure, or to Amazon, or to several places at the same time, can, can actually protect the data locally and in one piece of data locally and another piece of data in the cloud. It's a choice of the customer. It's also a choice of you. You may limit your customer. You may say, dear customer, we don't feel safe about Amazon. So don't go to Amazon. These are dangerous people. Uh, go to us. We have this rack in the corner of our office. And so your data is with you, and then it's with us here. That, that's your data. And, and we don't offer any other service because that's our choice. Its control is in your hands. And of, also, of course, we support any form of recovery. So uh, with that, and, and that is the um, two things which actually enable, well, three things which actually enable huge growth of our platform. Uh, it's really very uh, amazing how our cloud 
backup product is growing, which is the first part of our platform. Today, we already have in production Acronis Backup Cloud and Acronis Backup Service. And so we are very proud to announce it's at 800% growth in bookings over the last 12 months, which is quite amazing. Many of you have not, who, who of you selling Acronis Backup Cloud or Acronis Backup Service? Okay, some, but anybody who is not doing it today are losing out. And it was unimportant one year ago. Indeed, it was nine times smaller. It is nine times larger now. We have grown 10 times in managed storage, eight times in uh, managed devices, eight times in a uh, number of partners globally who support our sin. And of course, our products are becoming leading products. In fact, I didn't put some of the latest awards which we won just recently on this slide. And, and if you look at, at, at our growth, it's truly exponential. What is also interesting is we have announced last year that we have switched to quarterly product releases. And you can see every time we release a new product, we have a bump in acceleration. So this is a timing of new product releases. Every quarter, we release a new product. Today, we're in version five. We're releasing version six in, in, in the next uh, 45 days. And so we believe we will accelerate any further. Uh, to be honest, on my side, I'm actually starting to be concerned that uh, we will not be able to co-op with this growth. We really need your help. Well, I'm going to finish with this philosophical slide. Some of you might, might have seen it before. Uh, data has been important not only now, it has been important for ages. If you think about um, Egyptian pharaohs, one of the most ancient uh, civilizations on Earth, uh, they were also crazy about data. They spent their lives building these pyramids, and all these pyramids did is, is to um, keep the data about them, keep their mummy, which is their DNA and keep a bunch of artifacts about their lives and keep their life stories. And in fact, they sort of succeeded because uh, we don't know anybody from uh, 6,000 years ago but these people. And in fact, if we were to restore somebody from 6,000 years ago, uh, it's uh, the only people we can restore with some certainty is, is the people who were stored in, in, in this uh, data store. So this is an ancient data center, per se. And so from my standpoint, uh, data is not only about life, it's also about eternity and it's about resurrection. Everything you're gonna keep, uh, everything which will stay from you in this world, from your business or from you, for your generation of your children is the data. Nothing else will stay. Only data will stay. And so preserving data, managing data, and, and um, um, storing data is extremely important. So it's a, one of the basic needs. Acronis, in general, is based on three things. Execution of Acronis is based on three things. People, processes, and products. And I came back as a CEO about three years ago, and the first thing I needed to change is a team. And, and now we have a new, super motivated team, and I hope you will see it on the summit and meet our team members and enjoy meeting them. They definitely starting to see how we become a global technology leader. Processes, we hope we improved our processes. We have new channel program. I think it's working much better right now than it was before. It's perhaps more formal, but it's definitely much better organized. This is the year which is most exciting about me. As a manager, I have to deal with people and I have to deal with processes. That's unfortunate part of being a manager, but I really love products. And this is the year when we are releasing all new products. All of these products are switching to this Acronis hybrid cloud architecture which enables you to be successful in making money, delivers you control, and gives you a complete storage platform. We're in releasing new Acronis True Image, new Acronis Backup, and we're gonna talk more about it on the summit, new Acronis Access, new Acronis Storage, and of course, many new things in Acronis Cloud, Acronis Backup Cloud, Acronis DR Cloud, Acronis Files Cloud, all on the unified single architecture with a beautiful interfaces, with a very improved ease of use, uh, with a very high performance and high reliability. So please partner with Acronis. We're going to enable hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. This message is gonna get old. I actually said it probably two years ago, and I've said it last year, and, and it started happening now, but is it, I'm going to continue to repeat it in the next several years, and some of you will start making uh, m money with us, uh, or a lot of money with us, or huge amounts of money with us, you will see. And so follow my Twitter or follow Acronis, we are crazy about Acronis and we are crazy about enabling you to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey, for this inspiring speech. Thank you so much. We're gonna see more of you today and we're moving forward with this.